We are going to have uh, Terry Proctor get us started with the live stream, and then you'll be on to start the meeting. Okay, great. Do I introduce myself at that point? Yeah, feel free to introduce yourself, and then I think we can do the the BAC member introductions. I'll introduce myself, and then we'll um, uh, we'll let our staff introduce when they do their presentations. Okay, perfect. Karen, I'm going to hand it over to you first. Okay. I'm going to assume that we are good to get started. Want to go ahead and go, Karen? Yes, thanks, Marina. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our school improvement bond update. We're the bond accountability uh, crew that is here on May 25th, 2022. I'm Kara Toronto. I'm serving as the co chair. I think that's my official title um, for the BAC. And um, we will go ahead and kick this meeting off. And I'm going to start our round of introductions. And I'm going to hand it over to Karen. Hi, my name is Karen Wylett, um, retired from Providence Health and Services, designing construction and planning. And um, this is, I'm three and a half years on the BAC. Thanks. Norm, why don't you go ahead and go? Hi, Norm Dowdy. I've been with the, the BAC about a year and a half. I retired after 36 years with r &H Construction, and I am down in Rancho Mirage in Southern California, where it's about 106 degrees today. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, where it is not 106 degrees, but that is the humidity percentage. Um, Greg. Yeah, Greg DiLoretto, been on the committee for two years, retired uh, from the Tuolumne Valley Water District, and I'm just here at my home in West Lynn. The magic of virtual. Marina, I'll hand it over to you for uh, you to lead off the PPS crowd. Thank you. Um, I am also uh, not in any place where it's incredibly warm or humid, um, but I, I may have occasional dogs barking in the background, so... I'll try to mute when that happens. Uh, Marina Cresswell, I'm the Senior Director of the Office of School Modernization. And um, we do have a number of folks on uh, from OSM. Uh, I'm just gonna have the folks who are presenting introduce themselves when they do their presentation. And um, we are, I have posted the agenda up uh, in the presentation so that you can see that. We will do our best to stay on top of things tonight. I have asked staff to really hit um, sort of the top three highlights of their uh, programs that they're presenting. And then if you have questions that you'd like to follow up, then we'll follow up with specific questions. Um, we have a fairly packed agenda tonight. So with that, um, I will note that we have not received any public comment by email prior to the meeting. Um, if we receive any during the meeting or afterwards, of course, we will share that with the BAC members via email. Um, before we head into looking at our status update for the program, uh, just a reminder on our business equity uh, utilization data, there are some constraints to that. It is um, frequently one to two months behind. It is based on payments made, not on total contract value. Um, and it does rely on <clears throat> both our prime contractors and our first tier subcontractors to enter information accurately. And with that, we'll head right on into uh, the bond program administration and the equity, the, the equity numbers that we have for the bond program. Um, we have both business equity and workforce equity numbers here per our usual. Uh, generally speaking, our cumulative amount is starting to, to um, see a visible uh, increase. Um, that is cumulative since the start of the bond programs in 2012. We do also provide a rolling 12 month number that gives you a little bit better sense of where things are currently and it can kind of give an indicator if we think there are going to be issues um, further down the road. But as it looks right now, we're doing quite well with the most recent 12 rolling months. 
<clears throat> our workforce equity numbers have not changed from the last time. This is pretty typical. These are cumulative as well. And our apprenticeship, which is a mandatory 20%, um, we're actually at 24% and have been for at least a couple of years now. Moving to budget, starting with the 2012 budget, you'll see that's the one that's up on the screen. Um, not a lot to see there. As we've said before, we are just basically closing out 2012. We do have our sort of remaining major project with 2012 is the Grant Upperfield uh, Improvement Project. We expect to <clears throat> have most of that work, excuse me, <clears throat> completed by the end of June. Actually, the vast majority of it is going to be done um, by the end of this month, but there are a couple things going into June, and we do have one little lead item uh, scoreboards that will not be showing up till September, unfortunately. Um, COVID delays have impacted us quite a bit in a number of different ways. Um, so the most of that um, money you will see gradually uh, get spent um, that's remaining for grant. We are still doing some cleanup um, with Franklin uh, and the Grant High School Modernization as we close out those contracts um, and those projects. We don't anticipate that we're going to need any additional funding from other sources in order to complete the work at Grant um, for the upper field improvement. We are at this point thinking after going through and pulling all of the um, remaining budget and funding out of our other 2012 projects, we do think that we may have a little bit, little tiny, tiny amounts. And you can see, I think we've, we're forecasting at this point, roughly 200,000. Um, there are some things that we had held off on that were follow on projects to our 2012 modernizations. A um, couple things I think I mentioned in the notes, um, security cameras, additional security cameras at um, Franklin and Grant were both requests that were made um, at the end of those projects. So to the extent that we have any additional funding left after the Grant Everfield Improvement Project is complete, um, it will be going towards those sorts of things. We won't be looking for a whole new project. It will be really just trying to clean up some of the things that we previously said, hey, let's wait and see if we have the funds to do that as well. Any questions about 2012? Okay. Moving on to 2017. Um, probably the biggest thing that you will see both for 2017 and 2020 is that um, we have fully funded Benson and MPG um, with our various funding sources. And so you will see some changes in how those are split out between 2017 and 2020. With, um, with that, I've tried to be as clear as possible in the budget notes to help explain what's in the numbers, what has changed, and also what our total uh, project budgets are for Benson and MPG, because those are the two projects that split across the two programs. And as we've talked about before, um, we really have to track the funding by program. So it can be challenging in this report to see the full budget for those projects. Now, of course, when we do modernization status updates, you do see the full project budget on those status updates for the project. But on this one, you'll see it in part in 2017 and part in 2020. Um, one thing to note, so with MPG, we have uh, removed all of the 2017 funding uh, encumbrances and expenditures, except for prior fiscal year expenditures. We are still in discussion with our finance department about prior fiscal year um, moves. And so those are remaining in there for now with the funding, of course, that pays for them. And so you'll continue to see roughly 2 million sitting in MPG in 2017, but the remainder of the funding is sitting in 2020. Benson, of course, is split a little more evenly between the two. Um, the Kellogg project has returned um, funds to the program, so their budget number has dropped down, and they are um, 
they're still kind of working through little bits and pieces. There's potential for some minor amounts to still come back to the program. You'll see that reflected there. Um, the McDaniel modernization, they are still working through a couple things as well. And um, they are, we have returned the 2 million that the, um, the program had put in there for COVID related expenses because the project determined that they could pay for those out of project funds. So that is a change from the last report. Uh, what you do see there would be um, an additional two million that they think that can be returned. Now, uh, we are working through some follow on projects for McDaniel as well. And so that number is probably not going to, we're not going to be shifting any more funds back into the program for McDaniel for a while. We're going to let it sit there while we kind of work through the closeout and all of those um, sort of miscellaneous things. Uh, in addition to that, I did provide you with, um, of course, we're doing the health and safety, the 2017 health and safety um, project status updates tonight. However, as we've said before, we're only going to give you uh, those status reports for active health and safety programs. So if it's not active, such as the fire alarms, we're we're not going to keep telling you the same thing we told you when it completed. It's already complete. Um, but what we have done is we provided a an update memo to the board's um, facilities and operations committee last week that summarizes all of the health and safety programs, the 2017 health and safety programs. It um, provides the um, scope of work that was done for each of those programs, the funding, how it was spent, um, which sites it went to, and uh, you will also find links to the specific web pages for each of those programs so that you can go and find more information. Often our web pages have more specific scope information by site. So um, you can find more of that information there. That memo uh, was also part of your packets. Um, that will, of course, also be posted on our website. Um, we will be posting it to what we call the splash page for the 2017 health and safety uh, um, portion of the bond program that should be able to give people like a quick overview. And then if they want to dig in for more information, they can. We're not going to go over that information here tonight, other than, of course, the status updates um, for the active programs. And I'm trying to think what else um, is new on the 2017. The last new thing that I have in here is that we did enter in um, interest earnings that had been, that had not made it into our system, our e-builder system yet. They were another one of those, you know, sitting in the um, district's uh, financial system record, PeopleSoft, and not made it into e-builder yet. Uh, we've talked frequently in the past about future interest earning projections for the 2017 program in particular. Um, we had previously projected 12 million for those future interest earnings. Um, we have realized 8.8 .8 million of that um, in 2020 and 2021, and we're still um, getting the 2022 numbers. Um, those won't be complete until the end of the fiscal year. So um, we are looking very much on track with the forecast for the future interest earnings for 2017. Questions about 2017 before I move on? All right. So uh, the 2020 update, let me make sure I did get you to the 2020. Um, the bulk of the MPG program is here in 2020. The thing that might be most noticeable, the couple of things will be the funding of Benson, of course, with 2020 funds. Um, I have identified in the notes how much came from our program contingencies for both Benson and MPG. So if you're looking for those numbers, they are in the budget notes. Um, and 
the 2020 bond budget line, trying to think of how to describe this, um, that was set out to address the remaining balance of 2017. So we called it the 2017 bond balance, but of course it's 2020 bond funds. Um, that 152 million has been fully applied to the Benson project. Um, this was part of getting the full funding to, to, to fund the budget that was approved for it. Um, other than that, I think you're going to see that we continue to spend on our projects. Probably what might be noticeable if you're somebody who's into analyzing the data, uh, you'll probably see that we have put an awful lot of um, allocation towards our infrastructure projects. So we have been gearing up for summer work. We have been creating lots of new projects and allocating funding from our buckets, our unallocated buckets for those projects. And you'll see more of that information tonight in those project status updates. Any other budget questions? Greg, if you're talking, you're on mute. Sorry, talking to myself, actually. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Karen, if you're talking, we won't know because you're on mute too. So just a reminder. No, I'm not talking. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Great. Uh, okay. So um, I have provided some notes in the... Um, in the file that was in the folder. So the, there are, I'm not gonna show the notes on the screen, but there is you know, just some minor updates um, with the program, not an awful lot, um, just the typical sort of top level overview of some things. I think if it's okay with you, I will go ahead and go into um, project status updates. At the end of the meeting, the last thing that we're gonna be talking about is going to be um, uh, a requested topic, which was to talk a little bit about how we provide oversight of our projects. And as part of that, I will also share our organization chart. So um, I did, provided that in the, in the packets as well. And um, we'll kind of talk through that a little bit too. Marina, so, if I can provide any additional context there, let me know. Okay, we will do. Thanks, Kara. All right, so moving straight into 2020 capacity, and um, I uh, I wanted to just kind of do a quick introduction to this. So the capacity funds for 2020, we had $10 million set aside um, in the 2020 bond measure for capacity related projects. And when we're talking about capacity, we're talking about um, changes to schools uh, based on enrollment changes. So there was a bucket of funds that were set aside. They were not specifically targeted to um, any particular projects. They were intended to address the kinds of things that come up. Um, one of the things that came up uh, fairly quickly was um, moving Access Academy to Twilliger. And the other one that came up quickly was converting Harrison Park to a middle school. And um, Clark, who is going to be talking here shortly, uh, got the short straw um, and got both of those projects in his portfolio. So he's actually going to talk about both of those. And I do want to say that he is actually new to the Harrison Park project. Um, Jesse Steiger had been managing that project for us. Um, she has left uh, PPS um, decided to go do something a little bit different with her life. And, and so Clark has taken on Harrison Park. And I'm going to have him do a quick uh, sort of update on the progress of Terwilliger. Then he's going to give it back to me because I want to talk to you a little bit about scope and budget and give you some background. And then he can give you um, an update on progress. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Clark first for Terwilliger. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Maria said, I am Clark Ide. I am a senior project manager with OSM, and I did draw the short straw. Um, 
So first, first we'll talk about Terwilliger. And uh, for those who know, this is the access program moving from two locations into one singular location at a site we've had for decades, but has been leased out to various uh, entities over the years. Um, so just a, a couple quick updates. Um, as you can see, we've got our, our budget numbers. We're, we're looking pretty good right now. We have some, we have some possible um, risk items still as we're waiting on permits from ODOT or from PBOT for some site improvements that are being required. Um, we have the permit. We're working on some insurance pieces with our with our contractor to get that sorted away, sorted out. But uh, it has taken much longer than anticipated. Uh, and the same is uh, we have some mechanical upgrades we have to do in the main building of the school. It's a 1920s building, and it um, had some some serious degradation that we had to we found late. So we're we're trying to get this up to get everything put back together the way it needs to be, so we can have this thing open for school to start next year. Uh, as progress on the actual construction, we we hit substantial completion on, I would say, 90% of our items uh, last week. Uh, we're working through the punch list now. There are still some outstanding uh, uh, supply chain related items, some lighting, some some doors, some door equipment that we are still waiting for. Um, but it is in route. It's just a matter of when it shows up to be installed. Um, Hey, uh, I would say we would look at the, as far as our, our equity numbers for our consultant side, we're doing a great job on that. Not a great job on the contracting side. We uh, was a low big contract and it didn't have a lot of, we didn't have a lot of separate subs that would have fit in this category for them to really work with. So that's kind of how we landed there. Um, Trying to think, is there anything else we want to update on Terwilliger? Yeah, Greg. So you ma you made the comment, Chris, that budget's looking good, but it says red. And if I look at the Terwilliger, we started out with a budget of 4.4 .4 million. We wind up at 7.3, which is a 67% increase over what our budget was. Um, doesn't look real good. So, and we don't show in the funding anything that went in to make up the 2.9 million that we've gone over. Um, so, is bond accountability? How do we be accountable? Sure. Uh, I I actually have would have a question about that myself. I don't know where that 7.3 million dollar number is, Marina. That's sorry. I. That's that one doesn't look right to me, but I think that I, I that'd be worth us going back and looking at because I think I had some questions on the Twilliger numbers as well. One of the challenges for me in pulling the data together on this one is um, both Twilliger and uh, Harrison Park started out as projects that were um, funded on the other side of the house, which is to say they were they were funded with um, capital funds through our FAM group. And we have been going back and um, doing a lot of changes to the expenditures to reimburse FAM for their funding so that we can pay for it out of bond funds. And I, our data is messy. So I'm gonna uh, be the fall guy for that one. And I'm happy to provide you with an update via email afterwards. That's fine, just so we can tell, great. Yes. No, I apologize for that. Um, the the bigger issue with budget actually has to do with Harrison Park, and that's one that I want to talk about. So um, both of these are projects that were um, challenging to define at the start. Um, to Williger in particular, we were walking into a building that we knew very little about because it had been leased out. And so understanding what had been maintained or not maintained. Um, we had some some fairly significant unforeseen conditions at Terwilliger related to the existing mechanical system um, and some hazardous materials with that system. Norm? Yeah, I was just um, uh, on the equity 
Um, what, what are the projections or the thoughts going forward? Because uh, there's, you know, what, almost $19 million worth of work and there's 3.7 been done on the contractor side. Um, what, what, what are the, you know, how are you feeling about getting equity participation going forward? So I think um, it's, it is going to be an interesting mix. Um, when we talk about Harrison Park, that is the bulk of the funding that you see um, in that 19. And it's actually going to be more than that. I'll talk about that a little bit too. But um, we do have, we have one phase of Harrison Park that is currently contracted out. Um, it was low bid. We are looking at what the scope of work is specifically for each of the next two phases, which means we'll also be looking at how we procure that. But generally speaking, when we're talking about low bid, the best we can do is provide as much um, information to our certified business community and encourage them to to uh, propose on this, whether they're subcontractors or general contractors. Um, we are, we're not able to, to direct contract um, for this type of work. And, um, you know, there are some limitations to what we can get with low bid. That said, we do work very hard to make sure that our projects are known in the community and that we are providing information and reaching out to folks and encouraging them to, to work with us in many different ways. I think it is part of the larger equity discussion. And, and Norm, on, on to Williger in particular, once we got into contract with our GC, we did uh, kind of encourage them at every turn with any subcontracts that they didn't already have let out to, to pursue some of these equity numbers. And they, they did make a good faith effort. It's just a lot of other people are trying to pursue with the same the same subcontractors, and a lot of them are busy. I mean, they don't have they don't have time to do this work on all these projects because they're. I, th I think the goal is being achieved. They are they are working, um, just doesn't always fall to to our low bid projects. Yeah, it's it's kind of tough market conditions out there across the board uh, for a lot of reasons. So, thank you, Kara. So I may, yeah. be jumping, I may be jumping ahead, but like I, I just had one thought about that because when I was looking through health and safety and I know we're not there yet, but there were definitely some outliers where equity was like shining and I, I can't remember. It was probably like maybe with roof and, and something else. And I was just curious more so if there were lessons learned um, or anything that was potentially replicable on that front because I know we have this equity conversation every other month when we meet. And I, I just didn't know if you were seeing any sort of trends in the areas where equity was doing well. Um, and if that is a question better addressed later when we get to those reports, that's that's fine. But it was something that kind of piqued my interest when I was reading through the packet. Oh, that's a wonderful question, Kara. Um, I, I'm not gonna say that we've found a key to great equity numbers. What I will say is that it's very much luck of the draw. We have some projects where we have, um, our primary consultant is certified business. And so those numbers will look amazing. Um, and then the, the contractors that we are seeing, um, we get fairly limited interest in our roofing projects in particular. Um, and we tend to see the same contractors. They often end up with similar subcontractors, but that's not to say that we don't continue to encourage them to go out and look for other subcontractors. Thank you. I appreciate it, that. It is a complex discussion, and I think um, the folks that have been in construction also understand that when a general contractor is working with subcontractors that they are used to, they often have lower numbers. So when you're talking about low bid, you're going to find that the general works with the same subs over and over because that's how they get the low bid. 
they know what to expect. They don't have any unexpected um, and any risk that they're building into their pricing. So um, it's a challenge with the with the work that we do. Thank you, Marina. So, uh, Clark, are you done with Twilliger? Would you like me to hop into Harrison Park? I'd jump on in. All right, super. So Harrison Park, um, as I mentioned before, we're doing a conversion of Harrison Park to a middle school. And when we first set out with this project, um, we were still identifying what it would take to turn Harrison Park into a middle school. So we made specifications for our um, our middle schools, elementary schools. There's a separate set for each um, type of school, and those education specifications sort of set out what the the minimum standards are for rooms, for types of rooms, for spaces, for teaching equipment, for the things that are needed to teach that curriculum. We did a <clears throat> basically, <clears throat> excuse me, a comparison of the existing spaces in Harrison Park to. Um, what's in the education specification for middle schools. And as we dug into that further, we, we just realized that there were there was more that really needed to be done than what <clears throat> had originally been anticipated. We think that that is valuable work. We think it's important work. We think it's incredibly important that the middle school does meet our ed specs. Um, since we are making this effort and we're putting as much money into it as we are. Um, as part of the process, so what you see there, the estimated completion is really what it takes for us to get to education specs, right, for a middle school. What you do not see there yet will be the additional work that we are looking at that will also um, bring in the scope items that are funded by 2020 security funds. So we have specific scope items for the 2020 security scope of work. We will be utilizing that funding to do those items, but it will be under the umbrella of this project. Um, the same thing will occur with our um, ADA and SPED funds and scope. So we have already been coordinating with those project managers to understand what work needs to occur at Harrison Park to meet those, um, those uh, standards of work. And then the last thing that we'll be adding to the project is mechanical. So under the 2020 mechanical um, funding, we set aside a portion of the funding to do full mechanical system replacements for our worst schools, um, our urgent schools. Harrison Park is one of those schools. And so we are going to be adding the full mechanical system replacement to the project. That in and of itself is probably in the 11 to $12 million range. So that will be on top of what you see here, but it will be funded by 2020 mechanical funds. And we are taking that into account um, as we look at what we have in that funding source and what we're trying to to accomplish with that. Um, because we did make the decision to go forward with a full mechanical system replacement, um, it also meant that we are going to extend the timeline for the project. That is something that would be, um, well, let's just say it's going to be challenging to complete it in two summers. Uh, there was no way we would manage to do that and do all of the rest of the work in one summer. We already knew that we were not going to have enough complete to do everything this summer. So what's occurring this summer is a phase one. It's, um, you know, call it the, the, the low hanging fruit. And Clark is going to talk a little bit about phase one and what's in there. It will allow us to get some things out of the way. And then um, the bulk of the work is going to occur over the next two summers after that. So our um, schedule is going to push out a year further on Harrison Park than what we had anticipated. Um, we have already communicated this to the community. Uh, but we think it's it's worth it um, to do this work at the school that is uh, pretty desperately needed. 
So um, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer those questions. Like I said, Clark is fairly new to this, and so I didn't I didn't really want to make him try to explain it all. I probably wouldn't have done a very good job of explaining it all. So I I will I will go ahead right now and just kind of give you guys the the status and what's going to happen in the phase one piece of it. Um, so as Maria said, we're doing a phase one of construction starting uh, this summer. Uh, the contract has already been let out. Uh, we've actually got, had our first OAC meeting this week. Uh, we're getting the contractor geared up to get in there as soon as school is out to start work. And and what phase one is going to entail is it's going to be um, some some non-conforming upgrades that you know are required by the city. So we're we're adding a trash enclosure. Um, we're adding some covered bike parking that's required. Um, and we're in some minor parking lot adjustments and right away work uh, on the site that's also part of our permit. Um, like Maria said, it's very low hanging fruit. It's things we can do pretty quickly and easily. Uh, and then we're gonna also uh, do a refresh to the, the lobby area when you come in the building and the admin office is gonna get a remodel. Um, we're gonna add, a, add a, a window so they can actually see people when they walk in the building, which is a really odd transition for them. Uh, and then, uh just like a general remodel of their office area and we're gonna do a refresh on the cafeteria as well so uh these things are going to be you know new flooring new new ceiling tile uh paint uh we're gonna get some new casework and stuff in the in the admin office and, and just like a general refresh to kind of spruce these spaces up and make them a little more appealing um it would be a, we also think it's gonna be a good for the community to see that this is how we're this is what we intend to kind of reflect on the whole project and you'll get to see it when you walk in the door now. Um, so that's what we're going to do this summer. As far as the 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 upcoming phases, phase in two and three, the design is ongoing right now. We're still working it out. Um, we plan to have uh, our construction documents. Our current plan is to have our construction documents out for bid uh, in, in November. And so we can get things permitted and bid out by February of 23 to get this the phase two portion started in the spring uh, of 23 construction. Um, with the addition of the mechanical, we're, we're kind of we're working on how we're going to phase all the construction so it, it makes sense to we're only tearing apart one part of a building at a time and not going back and, and doubling down on effort. So uh, that's been the big push on our design team right now is to try to work on how we phase this construction work moving forward. Any, any questions? Yeah, any questions on that one? <laughs> Kara? It's one question, it's minor, but I think I'm like very impacted by what happened yesterday. We've talked a lot about security and Clark just mentioned a window for people walking in and seeing faces in the office. Um, having been at McDaniel and Lincoln, I'm very impressed with like the way the entrances have been redone. Is there anything that you could foresee in the last 36 hours that would change uh, your approach to security currently that may affect project costs, schedule, scope? Clark, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry, that's a good question. I, I, I can understand your, I can understand that, that concern. Um, oh, sorry, I got a dog. Uh, I don't know that there's anything that we would do differently in, in our current layout. Um, it's, a, it's something I would I would really want to double down with on the design team and see what they their thoughts are. Um, it will definitely be a it's a it's a more it will be a better design from a from an admin standpoint so they can see things that are coming into the front door as opposed to before they had no idea what would be coming into the front door. Um, the other thing I did forget to mention about phase one, and I'm glad you said that, is we are adding, I think, 13 new security cameras to the building as part of phase one. And, and that was that was something that was requested um, by the staff and, and they do. It, it is definitely needed. And we're going to we're going to get that in in the phase one work as well. Thank you. I also think it's it's valuable to add that with the 2017 security funds, we added access control to all of our school sites. All of our school sites are on schedules to have doors locked outside of the typical school start and end times. Um, 
And that access control included a camera so that the office can look to see who is requesting entry. So, Thanks, Marina. I picked up on that touring the schools, but I just felt like it was important. To absolutely. I think um, I think all of us who have children front and center in our lives uh, have been horrified. So to the extent that the work we do can improve the situation here in, at PBS, that's what we're doing. Okay, and we do have a couple fun photos, so we'll go ahead and run through those real quick. Um, photos and renderings. Clark? Yeah, so um, these are some of our new upgrades at Terwilliger uh, as part of the project. Uh, we did upgrade ADA access to, there's three buildings, so upgrade ADA access to all three buildings. Um, and and the picture in the top right is is just some parking lot upgrades and some new landscaping, which looks very nice. Um, the the picture at the bottom right is our our new library landings. What you don't see in this picture is what will be off to the left, and that are now installed our new uh, wheelchair lifts. So there's a wheelchair. There's it's a, an interesting layout. The library and the gym are like a half floor lower than the rest of the building, so they both get ADA wheelchair lifts. Um, off of these landings that have now been installed. So those are some of some of our upgrades just kind of generally in the building. Yeah, Norm. Um, I noticed in the the one parking area, the picture looks like uh, oops, I'm sorry. that was uh, instead of lawn, it looks like maybe something that's less water usage and less maintenance than lawn. Is there is, is that a theme across the new schools and stuff? To have, that, that is a theme. Um, it's definitely a theme on this site. Um, this site has a has an, an already existing large lawn in the front and in the back, um, and I know that our our forces struggled to maintain those all year long. So we went for a slightly less uh, something that would require less maintenance. So yeah, it's got a lot of uh, just kind of native plants that don't require a lot of water, and don't require a lot of upkeep to to kind of keep them looking good. Uh, and we have one of these little parking areas on both sides of the school. So um, it, is, it is kind of a theme on this one, for sure. Thank you. Um, and in these photos, uh, just some some of our, our new kind of standard teaching walls that we've put into to the buildings. Um, the, the, main, the main building had some larger, larger classrooms we've We've added walls in between to kind of cut them up, and that's what all the elementary school will be. Um, so uh, first or fifth grade will be in the main building, and some we also have art and Spanish there, so the middle school kids will come in. Uh, the modular buildings, um, which is a picture on the top right, is where the middle school will be, and those are in the kind of out uh, east of of the main building. Um, they have some they have some funky like twists and turns to them, just because they had a weird footprint. But uh, we we were able to to get a, what we consider a pretty good sized classroom out of this, this very small building, um, get three of them in there. Uh, and then we've, we've added new counseling offices. These are off the library. Um, and then the, kind of the biggest kind of improvement to the main building is, an, is adding an admin suite. So an admin office, uh, a nurse's office, which is to the, that window to the left. And then the, what's to the right of this, this wall that you see here is the principal's office. So we took a, a larger classroom and cut it up and made it into an admin office. And, and what you see like through the front of that, the other main window there, that's our secure uh, entry. So that has a, as Marina said, it would have a card reader and a camera outside that front door. And that would be the main point of entry once school's in session, kind of the only way in and out. Um, and the, the admin staff has the ability to buzz you in either of the doors. So um, Kara, to your point, this is kind of one of those newer kind of secure vestibules is what we have been calling them. Oh, and, uh, and so this is, uh, so Harrison Park, this is what we can offer right now. These are some renderings of what the phase one work, uh, will, what we're going to kind of try to accomplish. Um, so the top two pictures are, are of the, the lobby area and it, and the, the, admin suite which is in the right it's the in the picture on the right it's kind of the the 
top right of that photo. So you can see there's going to be a new window there. So when, when someone comes in that they, they're able to see. Um, right now it's just two brick walls with no, with no view for, for anything in there. And then uh, the bottom photo is just the cafeteria with some, some flooring upgrades and some new light fixtures and a, and a ceiling refresh. Yeah. Uh, who's, who are, who, what's the architect and contractor team? Oh, okay. Uh, good question. Uh, the architect is Studio Petretti and, and the contractor doing phase one is 2KG contractors who are also the same contractors that are doing Terwilliger. So um, I actually have the same team contracting wise on both projects, which has been kind of helpful. <laughs> we got, we've, we've got all the bumps out in Terwilliger. Hopefully we'll get through this one pretty easy. Hey Clark, this is Karen. Um, do Karen. do uh, or Marina? Do they have to do food prep on site, or is it basically a warming kitchen? Which which site? At Twilliger. Twilliger. Sorry, um, the... Yeah, Twilliger is just a it's it's just a warming site. Food will be delivered to the okay. site each day. Okay. We did do some upgrades in the kitchen though. So they have obviously the the, the food warming area, like a, a new refrigerator and a and a sink to wash the food, the like the the large dishes that the food comes in, so they can clean them there and then send them back out at the end of the day. So we, they do have some upgrades in the kitchen. It's not it's a very small kitchen, so it's not it doesn't offer a lot of uh, use for actually prepping food. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And I don't think uh, I don't think we'll take the time I think to go through the list of the improvements by phase um as i mentioned in my email i will make sure that the presentation itself is is uploaded after the meeting so you can go back and look at that um, if you'd like more information about those and we will go ahead and move on to the 2020 infrastructure starting with roofs, which um, I think you're going to see that there's a whole lot more roofs on this list than we had last time. So um, Steve, am I looking at you for this one? That is correct. OK. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Marina. So I'm Steve Simonson, Senior Project Manager with OSM Managing projects in the roofs and the mechanical upgrades, and we'll talk about roofs first. So um, as Marina said, we, as you can see here, there are quite a few more projects on our plate uh, coming up for this summer and um, on the already moving, starting to move forward for next summer. Um, this year we have, <clears throat> excuse me, this year we've got uh, one, two, we have five project, five roofing projects that are going to be going into construction here in just a few weeks. That's Ainsworth Annex, uh, Cesar Chavez partial re-roof, full re-roof at Glencoe, uh, full re-roof at, at Riki, and the remaining phase of the MLC re-roof that we weren't able to complete last summer due to material shortages. Um, on all of these projects, uh, it was a really difficult bidding market for us. Um, you know, as Marina stated previously, most of these projects um, did not get a whole lot of uh, bidders. Some of them only received one bid. Uh, we are very thankful that we did get those bids because we're now able to move forward on them. Um, there are two projects that I think at the last um, update uh, were originally slated to go for this summer, but due to some permitting issues have been pushed out to next summer. That's the Dunaway and West Sylvan re-roof. Um, both of those are, are um, hitting some permitting things that we're working through with the respective jurisdictions that they're under. Um, you will also see the Markham, Meek, Richmond, Skyline, Vernon, uh, and Winter Haven projects. Those are all ones that were identified through our through our assessments as the high priorities to, to take on 
as next steps. And so we are in design procurement right now for all of those um, currently reviewing proposals. Um, those will be starting design, uh, we're hoping by early July, which will put us well ahead of schedule of what we've been for the last several years. Um, and we're, we're very excited for that because it'll allow us to bid these projects um, probably in the November, December, January timeframe, as opposed to the March, April, May timeframe. And we're really hoping that that will give us both more uh, better, better contractors, um, better interest from the contractors to look at these projects and, and hopefully um, a little bit more competitive bidding environment. Um, on the projects this summer, uh, a lot of them came in a little bit higher than our original budgets, but not significantly, um, you know, nothing way out of the ballpark. And I think a lot of that is reflective in the high inflation that we're seeing in the construction materials. Um, wood and uh, particularly the wood materials are, are about as high as they were last summer. They, they kind of went down for a while in price, but they've, they've since come back up and, and we're, we're seeing that impact on the budgets of these projects. Um, it's sounding like from a material standpoint, uh, we're not going to see the, we're, we're, not, we're not anticipating the material um, shortages that we saw last summer. So that's, that's definitely good news for these, but um, they are all on very tight windows to get the amount of work done that we need to get done in just two and a half short months. Thank you, Steve. Do you, does the UC have any questions about the Greg first? I don't have any questions. I just feel we ought to comment. Everything in the columns is green. This is probably one of the best looking uh, slides we've seen in the entire two years I've been on here. You got to say something about it. We can't always ask you questions about the bad stuff. So I guess this is a great one for us. Well, but the, I hate to say it, but it's also because these are all brand new projects. <laughs> we, we haven't had time to hit problems yet. Take a win where you can get it, I guess. We'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> Norm, you're on mute. Just curious, these projects, do they go through a general contractor or are they direct to large roofing companies like a Snyder or somebody like that? These, these are all low bid projects. Um, we are open to a large roofing contractor being uh, operating as a general. Um, but given the amount of work that often comes along with these, because they're not, they're typically not just a roof. Um, we're also usually doing all of the seismic work that's associated with um, the seismic upgrades at the roof level. We're doing interior work to um, repair any water damage, um, things like that. There's, they, they have, there's really been very little interest in the roofing contractors in bidding them um, as, as a GC. So it's, it's primarily just been um, kind of some of the, the mid-sized general contractors like the 2KGs and Skywards uh, who have been bidding these projects. Okay, got it, thank you. We are definitely looking at how we can uh, be more creative in our bundling of our packaging of these roofs to see if we can get other contractors interested. Um, I think you can see we have an awful lot of work that needs to get done over these next couple summers. Um, we're we're going to be challenged by our market. Um. Any thought of doing these CMGC instead of low bid? Is that a possibility? Especially, particularly in, it sounds like there's some really market conditions. If you could bring people on board to, you know, provide that CMGC lead in to the start of construction. At this point, Norm, uh, it's a combination of the, the amount of experience that we have on hand with the CMGC procurement style. Um, so the folks that need to manage that internally um we we don't have a lot of folks uh that have done that on these types of projects 
um, our staff that have that experience are the ones who are working on the modernizations. Um, they're not typically doing these. And that does, that is pretty critical. It's important that we have experience with that procurement style because it, it comes with a lot of risk for us. Um, with that said, it's also not necessarily been the best um, financially. And so it's definitely a conversation that we have and we continue to have internally. We're not there right now. Yeah, I understand. It's There's advantages and disadvantages, you know, you could, yeah do pre-procurement and get things lined up and, and try to avoid some issues. But uh, um, I can see where there's challenging either way. So um, yeah, yeah, there's there's no good answers. We we try to work with the, the strengths that we have. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. And I'm guessing we're going to move to Robert for seismic. I had to find the non mute button. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Robert Joel. I'm serving as a project manager for PPS. Um, and I am working on currently the Lent phase two of the SRGB program. That uh, we've had the advantage of being able to work in the crawl space throughout the winter, which has really lessened our overall impact in the summer. Um, we've made huge strides. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good that we'll be able to wrap that up without any with any um, delays. Additionally, we've had the opportunity to procure any additional long lead items. Um, we still are missing a few odd things. We're missing a louver for uh, a roof, and that's taken almost a year to get. You wouldn't think that, um, but it is a specific louver. Um, and at Lent Creative Science, or sorry, Lent Creative Science, at Creative Science, um, we are commencing that work beginning the 13th of June. Uh, I've been working with Christy Mize, the principal there, trying to make sure that we get everything allocated as far as uh, our phasing. We will be doing that in two phases. Um, the front office area will be next summer. So the back half of the school, including the gym, will be this summer. Uh, good, strong contractor, 2KG, not 2KG, I'm sorry, um, Skyward. Worked with them in the past. They, we, they've got their best superintendent by demand, my demand, but your best guy there. Um, and I'm feeling really good about that. And we have had OACs and we're just getting ready to rock and roll. Um, these two projects are both uh, projects that received SRGP grants. So um, seismic uh, rehabilitation grant program through the state of Oregon. We were fortunate to receive the full 2.5 million available per grant. Um, in each of these, these run different years. We did not receive two grants in the same year. <clears throat> we typically received one. We, we put in for one. We have typically received one. Um, these projects, however, because they're, they are um, pretty intensive, pretty involved. There are more than one summer's worth of work. So um, as you can see from the schedule, um, Lent is finishing their phase two. Creative Science, of course, is starting phase one, um, and it will continue on to the next year. We do not have another uh, seismic project that is funded in part by SRGP grant in the pipeline at the moment. Um, we did put in for another SRGP grant in the most recent round <clears throat> that was uh, put in for Benson. And um, so, of course, we will not be using seismic funds as part of the, the um, Benson project. So we are still working through to see what the next project is that we will put in for a grant um, for. And um, the good news is that we have plenty on our plates to keep us busy in the meantime. Norm? Um, so within these budgets, I mean, usually these are really messy projects. Is there like abatement and mechanical and electrical related uh, reworks and maybe some roofing involved in the seismic workers? 
that somehow these projects are just pure structural work. Um, these projects are structural. The roof at Creative Science was done three or four years ago. Um, so we're not doing anything of that. That includes seismic shear. Uh, the mechanical aspect is very minor. Generally, it's remove and replace, if anything. Um, electrical, there are no electrical upgrades. It's, it's mainly, let's add another layer to these walls. And if anything's on that wall, we have to move it out to match that wall. Um, they're pretty, just a lot of structural improvements. Okay. We do, we do get some new finishes, obviously. Um, like down the hallways, we're getting some wainscot, things like that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Sure. All right. Thank you, Robert. We are going to go ahead and move on to mechanical. <clears throat> and I have a sneaking suspicion to Steve again. You are correct. Um, so the mechanical projects, uh, we have three of them on our radar right now. Uh, there is a fourth that may be coming that's not shown on here. It's part of the capacity. But um, the Bridger, Kelly, and Lint mechanical projects, those are all in design right now. Uh, Lint is, I think they just completed DDs. Um, this last week and Bridger and Kelly are about a month behind on that. Um, on those projects, uh, they're pretty extensive full mechanical upgrades that we're in design on. Um, the, they are going to be very difficult projects. There is no other way to put it. I mean, these are, these are on the level of invasiveness of the seismic projects, um, what's going to be what we're anticipating um, for invasiveness is going into every single classroom, removing the existing mechanical systems and replacing it with new. Um, we are looking at a VRF system at Lent and at Bridger and Kelly, we are looking at a heat pump system. Um, that was based off of the recommendations from our engineers. Um, at all three of these sites, there will be electrical upgrades that are required. Um, we are working to uh, follow the district's uh, decarbonization goals and, and, and plans that are in place for the climate goals. So all of these systems will be all electric systems. Um, that does definitely come with the with some work that will have to happen with the electrical and um, kind of leads me into the scheduling concerns with these, the uh, kind of the biggest thing is, like I said, every every school we're going to be working in every single room, but on a lot of these, on all of these projects, we have significant long lead items. Um, some of the mechanical equipment we're hearing can be six months lead time. Um, the electrical equipment, we already know that switch gear for some of these is up to a nine to 10 month lead time. Um, and so what we are working on with our architects and with the schools is trying to figure out a plan for kind of leapfrogging from room to room with our contractor and, you know, putting our backbone infrastructure in for the new systems, um, doing everything that we can during the school year in an occupied building, uh, and then coming back over the summers to hook up all of that, you know, demo out existing equipment, um, we're working through those plans right now, but uh, needless to say, these are these are going to be um, some very big projects that we have on our hands here, and and there's there's a lot of work at each site. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, um, so, given that, Steve, how comfortable are you with the budget? I mean, it sounds like um, there's more there's more risk involved. <laughs> There is definitely risk involved, um, and it it's something that we're really trying to work through. Um, we have gotten some our some of our design estimates back from our design teams. Some of those have been definitely higher than what we are budgeting, and so we are trying to work through where uh, where we can adjust scope to accomplish what we're still trying to meet and what might need to change in the designs. But I think also we're certainly looking at 
you know, some very high cost projects here. And um, it's really trying to sharpen our pencils to make sure that we're delivering um, what was promised in these projects while also maintaining our budget as best as possible. Now, according to the, the previous slide, we had 47 million that had been unallocated. Was that intended to go to other schools or will the over budget come out of that amount, out of that money as well, or? So that, um, I'm glad you actually brought that up, Greg. Uh, like, we'll go back to that slide. So the way we currently are looking at it, and we were, we'll be presenting some of this information to the facilities and operations committee as well. But what we're currently looking at for the mechanical work in particular, we had um, some urgent emergent projects that we already knew about um, from doing assessments of our worst performing schools. And we wanted to go ahead and address those urgent sites. Um, that is essentially the sites that you see here. The we are keeping aside a certain amount of funding to do smaller scope projects across more sites. So we are looking at um, figuring out what that scope is specifically, but some of the things that we're looking at include uh, upgrading our DVC controls across um, the vast majority of our sites. So we're, we're talking potentially 80 school sites um, with some you know, isolated equipment upgrades to address things that are not compatible with the new controls, um, that sort of work. So we're, we're going through and developing that scope of work. Um, we have a number in mind that we've kind of set aside for that to, to be able to do that those types of projects. Um, but we're also leaving a cushion for additional needs for these because what you see here for budget is really very preliminary. Um, these are not projects that we do very often. Certainly not through the bond program. We have not done these. And um, Costs right now are very challenging to predict, and we're finding that even our our um, design architects and engineers don't have a better sense of cost than we do. Our contractors don't have a better sense of cost than we do. Everybody's pretty much guessing, um, particularly for projects where the construction is still a little bit out, you know, where we're still trying to figure some things out. So. Um, we do anticipate that there's a potential for these numbers to go up, and we are holding aside funding for that within the, the mechanical funds. Are these the three biggest ones in the mechanical, these three here? They are, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these three plus Harrison Park will be our four sites that have okay. system replacements. That will be it. Everything else is going to go towards um, smaller scope across more sites. Hey, Marina, it's Karen. Yes. So, so the consultants that you use for designing the mechanical systems, are those mechanical electrical engineers, or are you doing any bringing uh, mechanical contractors on board and having them almost do like a design build or not? Well, we're currently using the engineers, but we're also talking through um, bringing on board contractors for services during design to help us talk through logistics and systems. So yeah. not doing design build, but but bringing them on basically for their expertise as a consultant function. Yeah, and, and probably better help with budgeting. Yeah, and that is that is part of it as well. So we're, we're at this point, we're going to move that, that model forward with um, Harrison Park. So that's going to be our kind of test as we um, look to bring on a contractor that can help us talk through some of that with Harrison Park. And yeah. then we'll we'll roll that to the to these as well, I'm sure after that. Okay, thanks. There are some limitations to how we do that. So we, we're, we're trying to be very 
thoughtful and careful about how we do it to ensure that we don't limit contractors being able to bid on the projects that that um, are ultimately designed. So if we're good, uh, we could move on to 2017 health and safety. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we are going to start with asbestos. So Glenn, you're up. Okay, uh, hello everybody. I'm Glenn Bryant, I'm the project manager for the asbestos part of the health and safety work. Um, started at uh, around 2018 and have been to about 20, 20 schools so far. Some of them uh, different phases. Uh, have to go back to finish up some work um, that can't be all done at once uh, due to shutting down the school uh, areas so the custodians can do all their work during the summer. Right now I'm in planning or uh, final phases of contracting out uh, Six six schools right now. And the uh, scope of work varies from each school, and depending on uh, what's needed, what the hazards are, range from uh, floor tile to pipe insulation, and, uh, lots of uh, crawl spaces that uh, need cleanup, things like that. Overall, we've been doing a lot of good work there limiting the or lowering the risk uh, to a, the asbestos that's easily accessible to students or may create a hazard if uh, disturbed at some point in time. So um, we've been addressing a lot of much needed maintenance work that's been put off on a lot of the projects also. And um, we've worked with uh, risk management and uh, a lot of the maintenance uh, crew there to develop a lot of these scopes of work uh, and prioritize what uh, needs to be done the most uh, throughout the schools. So that's a, pretty much a summary if there's anything else. That, on the previous page, Glenn, we had the 32 million for the middle school conversion. That's not the Harris. That's not the Harrison one, right? No, that's no, that's not. Them? The middle school conversions was a set of projects um, that were completed as part of the 2017 okay. uh, bond. And it was a single project in eBuilder that included multiple sites, including okay. Tubman. And so, as I mentioned in my email to the committee, what one of the changes that I've made to these reports is to only identify um, asbestos funds within what you know we would typically have as our bond funds category, and then anything outside of asbestos is in the other funds. So those other funds could be a combination of bond funds and non-bond funds. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And what it does is it gives you the full project cost, that should be the same full project cost, whether you see that project show up in asbestos or you see it show up in other places, but it'll give you the full project budget. So the numbers, yeah, that one in particular, because we used funding sources from multiple of the health and safety categories, you're gonna see that middle school conversion project show up in a multiple um, sets of, of project status reports and it'll be shocking every time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Norm? Um, could you go to the next slide? Yes, sir. So, Kara, you were looking for a bright spot on equity contracting. Here's one, 40 some percent. I know. It was asbestos and like roofing and like one other one. And I was like, holy yeah. cow, how do we get more of those? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's the market. I mean, within like uh, asbestos, there's a number of uh, very capable. Uh, minority contractors that, that do a lot of this type of work. So it's just kind of the, the market segments are, are all different. 
I literally looked yeah. at this one like four times and was like, are those percentages right? Or do I need a different glasses prescription to see that correctly? <laughs> yeah, those are correct. And like Norm said, those are, um, it is market segment. Um, we, we do have a number of really great certified businesses in the asbestos abatement um, trades. Yeah. And we work with them a lot. Yeah. And I, I, I will say on the broader equity thing uh, situation uh, with all the affordable housing, all sorts of affordable housing projects of all sizes and types of very large projects, they're all competing and drawing capacity down uh, for the equity uh, subcontractors. So it's it's tough out there. To, to be. Yeah. Anyhow, great job. Thank you. Well, I think we'll go ahead and move on to our lead paint. Um, and thank you, Glenn. Chris, uh, just so you know, I've got two pages on this one as well, and the schedule's on the next page, but I don't think you need it. So no. <laughs> if you want to just work with this one, we'll probably flash through the schedule pretty quickly on the next one. All right. Um, hello, my name is Chris Boyce. I'm project manager for Paint Stabilization Program under the 2017 Health and Safety. Um, so it's just, so I'm not reading right through the slides, uh, just a couple of little update or progress information. We're working, you know, really quickly through our, or working well through our phased approach. Again, as a quick summary, we did a phased approach because I wanted to address the paint that was in the most accessible areas to the most at risk population first. So addressing locations, um, in classrooms where youngest children are present first. And then um, once all those were locations were done, then coming back and in some cases revisiting a school multiple times, which may not be the most um, you know, cost effective approach, but we wanted to address the most at risk areas first or the most areas that could potentially be a risk. Um, so we are working through our phased approach um, and we're doing that with a combination of in-house paint crew and paint contractors. We are, one thing that's been interesting about working through this phased approach is it's kind of been a nice realization that I think it's been, we prioritize those phases appropriately because as we've been working through and we come back to a school, we see kind of less and less items to be addressed. And so that's nice. It's not like we're going to a school. We've been focusing on one area, then we move on to the next school and we see something that's, you know, really eye catching that's a real hazard. Generally, as we've been getting into new locations, uh, there's less and less work as we move into those new locations. So I feel good about how we prioritize the work. That being said, you know, there's definitely more to be done. Um, one thing that's been interesting or one thing, because we've been seeing that at the schools as we move into that there's less maybe in interior work is the in-house paint crew. When they get to a site, they've been doing some more inclusive work while they're at site rather than doing one area work and then coming back later to do it. They've been doing, trying to get rid of, or trying to accomplish work, uh, addressing multiple phases at one time. So they've been working in some middle schools and some things that we'll see, I think, moving forward is the phased approach will start kind of ticking off some of those schools on our list quicker because they may be at one site and they may address what we're calling phase two work, phase three work, and phase four work all at one time. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're looking into some uh, work that is addressing substrates of some of the painting um, items that we have to address. One thing that we've been seeing is there are some areas where windows, siding, substrate is in such failed condition that just painting it won't adequately address the, the risk or the hazard of the lead. So we're looking at how, in what cases we can paint with a heavier duty paint to address the lead hazard or in what cases we need to maybe address um, like some siding replacement in limited uh, locations to address the lead risk. Uh, one thing that we've been seeing about risks is uh, supply chain issues are still a little bit of a problem, but we have addressed that to a certain extent by getting some additional suppliers on board. Uh, but that's kind of a temporary thing. Uh, we're going to go out. Um, we have three contractors, sorry, three suppliers that are helping with supply chain issues. And we're going to go out for a procurement for one larger scale supplier. And one thing I'm going to ask for them to address is how they are addressing supply chain issues. Um, and so hopefully that is becoming less and less of a risk, which I, I think it is from what I've been seeing in the, um, with our supplies. 
Uh, also with bidding, we have three large exterior painting projects coming up this summer. I'm going to try to get another two or three on board as well. Uh, those walks are happening in a couple of weeks. The one thing that I'm seeing under that I would say is under risk is we're of our four contractors. Uh, two of them basically told me uh, just last week that they probably won't be bidding on work because they had some other large scale um, commercial jobs come up that they can commit crews to for like three or four months at a time. So unfortunately, it seems like we're losing some bidders. So we are getting bids, uh, but I'm just worried about what that might mean moving forward. So I'm going to look into some options addressing that. Um, addressing it just because it's come up a couple of times, equity. Um, <laughs> I am not the shining star there. Uh, one thing that's interesting there is of our four onboard contractors, two of them are certified businesses. They have not bid on any of our painting work that we've uh, let out to them. So that's hampered us. Um, suppliers for paint supplies, when to address the supply chain issue, I had some um, procurement put together for three suppliers. I reached out to suppliers. I reached out to the state. I don't know anyone that's a supplier um, that is any sort of certified type business. So I was a limit, little bit limited there. And so I definitely need to investigate, are there other ways to bring other, some, some other folks on board? Um, one thing, it, it would be very limited, but one thing that is possible is I know some of the labs for testing of bulk samples and air samples and things like that associated with lead work. Some of those are certified businesses, but again, that's very minimal um, amount, but at, at least it would be something and um, definitely open to other ideas. Any questions on the slide materials or the brief summary items? Thank you, Chris. All right, thanks. Chris, congrats on yeah. keeping the lights on until you presented. Good job. I know, yeah, that's something, right? <laughs> I thanks. think he snuck out and turned them on when other people were presenting. <laughs> I'm just working my magic. <laughs> the five phases that Chris was describing is Oh, right. Not a small thing. There, <clears throat> from what I remember, Chris, ten thousand locations across the district. Yeah, the scope of work was using in phases, yeah. and we're doing a, a really good job getting on top of it. Yeah, all of the work is based off of assessments that were done twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen, and yeah, I think that added up to those assessments identified over ten thousand locations, and we kind of parsed those out by what was you know, what we felt were the most risky situations and locations to address first. And um, I think that looking back now, there could have been some economy of scale of doing like bigger painting projects when we were in a building. But at the time, I looking back, I think it's a really the right choice because I didn't want to be worrying about the ceiling in a admin's office or a storage room when there was still baseboard at a kindergarten reading area that was peeling and flaking. And those criteria, those are listed in, if you go to the document in the folder that is the memo to the Facilities and Operations Committee with the Health and Safety Update, um, you can find the section in that memo that is specific to the, the lead paint, and you'll see how the phases are described, what the criteria are for those different phases. Norm? Yes. Just curious, how, how large an in-house crew are you running uh, on doing this work? Right now, it is a five-person crew. Um, one thing that's really nice about having the in-house crew is uh, during the school year, they work swing shift. So they show up at a site at the end of the day and start setting up. One thing that makes it very difficult is at the end of their shift, they put everything back so they're not impacting you know, the, the teaching. Um, but they are very adept at navigating all of that. Um, we've had, you know, one thing I have written down that I didn't mention is, you know, we've had no complaints. Um, you know, there've been minor concerns, minor bumps here and there, but I mean, it's, it's worked out really well. They, being an in-house crew, being PPS employees, they are definitely uh, great at just, you know, talking with the principal and the custodians, getting things set up ahead of time, uh, talking with teachers or leaving notes with teachers, letting them know we're gonna be in a space. So I feel like a lot of this work, if we were trying to do it with contractors, would be, you know, 
really difficult to navigate some of those things. And so it's been, it's been, it's been great having that in-house crew to um, slip in and out of those spaces, you know, and really work their magic. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's a, it's wonderful. You could get a crew together and keep them together. And, and uh, like I say, you don't have that learning curve. They really, they're going in there, they know what they're doing and they can knock it out and yep. uh, keep moving. Yeah, especially with this phased approach. Like I was thinking about that early on. I was like, you know, how do you go to a, you know, work with a contractor and say, okay, we're painting that baseboard, but we're not painting that baseboard right now. You know, it's it like, would be, it would be impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and they've been, yeah. and even the in-house paint crew thought I was a little bit crazy at first, but they, you, we worked together really well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Steve, do you get the starring role on this one as well? I'm going to find my mute button. I will take that one. So this is the 2017 roof improvements. Um, as you can see here, we only have a few projects still open. Uh, that's Dunaway, MLC, and Riki. Those are, these projects just have the design services for the existing projects that are under construction under the 2020 bond. Um, so Riki and MLC will complete this summer. Both of those projects will uh, get completed. This in the 2017 bond will be completed this summer. And the Dunaway project, the design for that will complete, uh, it'll, well, the design will be completing very shortly once we get through our permitting issues. And the this project, the design portion of the project will close out next summer after the construction is complete. Um, we do have about $3 million left uh, that's been swept out of all of these 18 roof projects that we've done. Um, and I think Marina, in talking with her, we are kind of looking at how we could allocate that um, potentially from a project that's been identified under the 2020 bond um, effort to prioritize roofs. So as we got to the point where we were, we were still figuring out um, how much was returning from all these projects that were closing. We did not want to take on additional construction work with these funds. It is, as you've seen, incredibly challenging for us to split a project between different non measures. Um, when we split it between design and construction, it's a little bit easier for us to do because it's not the same contract. So we went ahead and paid for the design with the 2017 funds. We moved forward the construction with the 2020 funds. Now that we've pulled back a lot of our funds, um, we have a better sense of how much we have remaining in 2017 roofing, and we're looking at how we might be able to utilize that funding. So it might be that there's smaller roof projects to do. Um, it may be that there's smaller projects that are um, performed by our partners in the FAM, but we actually pay the cost of those projects. So we're still addressing roofing issues with bond funds. So we're still working through that. We should have more information, I think, by the next time we, we chat. Um, security, and I believe we do not have our um, security PM on the call. Darren, I don't know if you want to do a quick update on the security projects. There's not an awful lot left to update. Yeah, 2017, I can jump in. I'm director of construction under Marina um, for OSM. Uh, Eric Nace is our project manager. He's not here today. We have two final projects to complete security. They're fencing projects at Beaumont and Cleveland high schools. And they would have been done already, but because of supply chain issues, it's, it's just exterior fencing and card access type fencing security, uh, exterior security fencing. Those will complete in August. August, September, and they would have completed about four months ago if we didn't run into supply chain issues. So um, we're a little bit behind, but we're hoping to complete by August. Um, 
but it's just really just supply chain issues for components of that exterior fencing. <clears throat> we also did some, uh, ran into some issues on site with um, existing utilities and vaults underground that were not, that were unforeseen. And that's thrown a little wrench in into it. Um, but I think I, we should be done by the end of summer <clears throat> with those last two final projects for security. Thanks, Darren. Water quality, Mr. Varblow. Uh, good evening. My name is Steve Varblow. I'm the project manager for the 2017 Bond Water Quality Project. Um, we've come a long way in the past five years from fixture replacement to um, filtered water program. Uh, as of this point, we have completed the designs for all uh, PPS facilities, that's schools and administration buildings. Uh, we've bid out all that work, and now we're working to complete the construction, um, substantially complete by uh, the end of this coming summer. Uh, you can see a snapshot of all the work that we've done in the materials provided by Marina prior to this meeting. Um, I would have liked to highlight a couple things uh, that uh, Marina asked us to, to pick three items to, to highlight. And uh, one of the things I'd like to highlight is the accomplishments. Um, for the past five years, we've worked really hard to uh, make sure that we've used the bond money in a responsible way. Three years ago, when we presented the filtered, uh, the filtered uh, a fixture project to the bond or to the uh, school board. Um, we had come up with a estimate for the program costs with contingencies, and those numbers are actually holding up today. Um, uh, also, with this filtered program, with that money, we've been able to expand services within the schools to areas that may not have had drinking water previously, um, like some of the annex buildings, cafeterias, isolated hallways. Um, also, dealing with COVID and supply chain, workforce uh, shortages. Um, we've been able to keep the budget on track. And in the past couple months, I've been working with uh, Marina and Darren to um, see what money we can free up to, to fund other uh, health and safety programs. And we're looking to uh, return about a third of our original budget back from this project. Um, one of the other aspects I'd like to to stress in the uh, accomplishments is uh, our filtered drinking water stations. This is where a majority of the students will be getting their daily drinking water. These are combination uh, bottle fillers, drinking fountains. And from the ones that we've installed, over 300 locations in over 60 facilities so My. far that we've, that we've installed and tested, um, we have been returning results of uh, about 0 0.266 parts per billion. 80% um, of those test results have been come back as non-detect. And uh, just so you know, the, the 0 0.266 um, parts per billion, our goal for this project was one part per billion and the state level is 15 parts per billion. So that's a, that's a, a fantastic number for these drinking water stations. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was some of our risks. So um, uh, the one thing that we've been kind of having an issue with uh, since the beginning of this filtered water program was the schedule. Um, when we presented this to the uh, board and started the work, um, things were shut down pretty quickly um, after our pilot program due to COVID. So during this entire uh, fixture or the, the filtered drinking water program, we've been working with uh, COVID, which has led to some significant um, procurement delays. Like our drinking uh, fountains were a three week delay or a three week procurement at the beginning to a five to six month uh, procurement uh, near the end. And actually currently that's what we're seeing as well. Also some uh, interesting things like cabinetry is taking three to six months. Um, so we've been seeing these delays, also COVID related delays and, um, and just workforce uh, delays is um, getting people back to work. Um, and one of the issues that came up uh, because of this was our contractual um, relationship with our IDIQ 
contractors. It was an initial four year construction or uh, contract period and that expired last August. Luckily, PPS was able to extend that for uh, one year um, due to unforeseen circumstances because of COVID, which brought us to uh, August of this year. And then this spring, um, to make sure that we are able to finish the program, uh, PPS extended it one more time till the end of this com uh, of this current year, to the end of 2022. Um, we're planning to be substantially complete still by the end of the summer, but this last extension will allow us to uh, finish up any small issues that may extend past the summer. Uh, one of the other risks that we're watching is um, the uh, um, the follow-up testing. So as part of our process uh, with these fixtures is we install it, we test it uh, before it's turned on, and then we test it several more times during the working life of the filter, the one-year working life. Um, we're seeing a small uptick in the test results uh, for these follow-up testing. Uh, not so much with the drinking water stations, which we've seen about a, a 0.1 part per billion uptick from the initial testing to the follow-up testing. It's more our specialty fixtures in our health rooms, uh, staff rooms, uh, special education rooms and such. Uh, also our food service. Um, we've been seeing upticks of uh, as much as uh, over half, uh, 0.6 parts per billion, so over a half a part per billion. Um, and now we're looking at ways of, of trying to uh, limit that, that increase. Um, some things we're looking at is possibly finding a different fixture. Our current fixtures are, um, are what they would call lead free um, per national standards, but uh, there is a small amount of lead that is still allowed in the processing, uh, in the, the, the manufacturing process of that. We're also looking at uh, other ways like uh, reducing flow of the, of the water. Um, I do want to note that even though these, uh, we do have this small uptick in the numbers. The, the numbers that we're seeing is still lower than our pre-filtered numbers. And so the um, we're still seeing uh, quality water being delivered to these schools. It's just something that we're concerned about. Just as an overview, I'd like to add that the end of this program and the goal, and I think we're gonna reach it, is we're gonna have the cleanest water in the nation across any district out there that's producing any any type of data or information on their testing. We're doing a, I think we're doing an amazing job and we're gonna have a, a pretty amazing success story. Norm, you had a question? Uh, well, first, yeah, great job. Five years uh, finished strong in the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, is there is there any concerns on the replacement filters as far as supply chain, you know, supply or potential cost increases with those? Um, so the uh, we've been uh, we've been working with 3M this entire time. Um, they have not uh, they have not given us any reason to um, question the supply. Our um, our contractors have never had an issue getting the filters. Uh, they've been having issues getting other parts and pieces that we've needed, but uh, the filters have always been um, uh, easily accessible. And 3M has been working with us from the very beginning um, to make sure that uh, that we um, that this program is going um, going as smoothly as possible from their side. So um, they've actually done some a little bit of testing for us on on the manufacturing side. Um, they've uh, they've been a close uh, partner in this process. Yeah, they certainly can tout this success story uh, when they go to other uh, municipalities. So yeah, yeah, great job, thank you. And Norm, this is another one where that equity looks great. So again, like success story across the board. I, I was looking at that, although the MBEs, <laughs> it's a lot of ESBs, so there's always the nuances there, but. Uh, Still, it's such a limited scope, you know, that it is hard to, to do that. But the, the, the overall number looks great. I think one of the, the great things too about this, I think as um, Steve mentioned, there is a significant amount of funding that's not going to be needed to complete the goals of the program. And I say complete the goals, in fact, exceed, exceed the goals of the program. Um, 
and we've pointed that out in our update memo as well. But at this point, we're looking at potentially $12 million that could be applied to other health and safety projects, of which there are, there are always many places where we can apply those funds. So that is a conversation we'll be having um, here in the future. We do want to make sure that we get through the through the last of this, as you say, finish strong, and um, you know, make sure that we're not we're not giving money away uh, too soon. So, any other questions? Okay. So we will move <laughs> move on to what looks like the fun part for Kara. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just excited because like we're shockingly on time and I feel like that's such a win since it's like 10, 15 for me. Um, I don't know. I just think it's really important to point out that like a few of us sat down, um, which we can do outside of quorum and talked about reporting. And I think like one thing that became really apparent in that meeting is that there has been varying levels of transparency shown, but the challenge has been that OSM has grown significantly as the bonds have um, occurred over the course of a decade and the reporting can be challenging to present. Um, and I think that what I took away from that discussion, Marina, with you was that there is a lot of oversight and I don't know that everyone was fully aware of it. And so that's, I think what got us to this part of today's presentation and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm excited about it because one, we're on time and two, like this is pretty cool to see like how much um, growth there's been and like what it actually takes to make sure this is being reported back to us on a every other month basis. Thanks, Kara. And I, this is gonna be the only cool graphic you see in the next couple of slides. It's a lot of words, and so I'm just going to kind of walk you through it. I could have done a bunch of graphics, but I was afraid it would take too much time. Um, so just very quickly, this is our most recent organization chart. I say our most recent. I feel like I update this or could be updating this almost every month um, because the growth has been so um, uh, incredible over the last couple of years. Um, and just a, you know, kind of a cheat sheet to the org chart. Um, blue are the employees that we employ directly through PPS. Um, green are our wonderful contracted employees um, that we work with outside consultants um, who are fully embedded and, and uh, we still consider them OSM, um, but we pay them differently. And uh, if it's, a little bit lighter in color that means it's a vacant position that we are uh, recruiting for so you can see we do actually have vacancies we are recruiting for them um, and we will continue to see new faces here um, this change is not also not only because we we add people but also because we we change projects right so as as our modernizations in particular um, finish up those project managers, you know, we're, we're moving them on to, to new projects. Um, and so they shift around within the org chart as well. So uh, this just kind of gives you a quick overview of how we're set up. I think um, probably the parts that are helpful to kind of keep in mind that upper level. Um, obviously, that's my name up there at the top. But the, the folks um, directly below are what I consider our OSM program management level. Um, they are, you know, um, Darren Lee, who's our director of construction, overseeing um, all of our the project side of the house. Um, one of the things that we're currently doing is recruiting for a second director of construction because um, Darren does not have eight arms, um, nor are there five of him. And I feel like that's kind of what we would need for the scope of work that he has under him. Um, so we're looking to uh cut him some slack maybe allow him to take vacations every once in a while and um, get somebody else to help take some of the load uh, we also have um lauren polling who is here um, tonight as well she oversees our business operations side of the house those are the folks that that support all of the project management 
um, staff and what they're trying to accomplish. So that includes our contracting, our invoicing, our um, e-builder administration, um, our accountants, um, whew, Derek, who does pretty much everything to support us. Um, yeah, they're all in there too. Over on the um, far right side, these are folks that uh, are bond funded, but they don't report to us directly. So they're embedded in other central services departments of PPS um, because we take up so much of their time with our work. So um, we fund folks in procurement, in IT, and in finance. Um, it, we, we put a lot of burden on the system, and so we pay for that burden. They're fully dedicated to the work that we are doing. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview. Uh, open to questions about the org chart, or I can go ahead and move forward. Okay. All right, let's talk project oversight. There is a lot that we do that I think people don't see um, or realize. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about some of these things in particular, but on a daily basis, we of course use eBuilder. eBuilder is a um, software system that allows for automated approvals of different types of processes. So you can submit things, they get routed through a, a preset approval process to various people who have to add information or approve information um, that sends it off in some other direction to another person, depending on the variables. Our eBuilder maps are, you know, lines here. And if this equals this, it goes here. And if it equals this, it goes over there. And if you don't like it, you send it back. Uh, they're complicated. But what it means is that there are a number of different things that we do through an automated software process that um, is essentially lots and lots of people putting eyes on different aspects of a process. So we'll talk a little bit about processes in the next one. Um, also, daily oversight. Um, I sign off on every single P card purchase. P cards are our, um, our district credit cards. Um, we use them for certain types of purchases. It's pretty highly regulated. Um, as the budget holder for the bond funding, I approve every one of them. So my staff know that if they put something on their P card, I'm going to see it and I will have to sign off on it. Um, on a weekly basis, Darren meets with all of our project teams for check-ins. On a monthly basis, we have project review meetings that include project status updates. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those as well. And I'll talk about those meetings too. And then on top of those things, we do, um, we approve requests for development, which are uh, when we're requesting that our procurement department initiate a procurement process. So I personally sign off on all of those. I sign off on every recommendation to award, every budget increase request or any type of budget transfer comes through me for approval as well. We also have design phase approvals for our major projects. Um, when we get to the end of the design phase, we have a process in eBuild that is called a DPA process of design phase approval that is essentially requesting approval to move to the next design phase. Um, and the, the project team provides documents to show that the scope, the schedule, and the budget are in alignment before we move forward to the next phase. Talk a little bit more about eBuilder processes, just to give you some uh, understanding of what that actually means. We say process a lot, we use eBuilder a lot, but this includes things like invoice approvals. Um, every invoice or journal entry is done through an invoice approval. And those are approved, that routing is done through financial limits of authority, which are laid out in our administrative directive. So um, within, our system, our project managers have limits of authority of $10,000. Beyond that, Darren and I go up to 150. After that, it goes to Dan. Dan is actually in eBuilder as well. 
and he signs off on things up to 500,000. Beyond that, it goes to our uh, director of procurement. So we have limitations on um, who has the authority to sign off on expenditures. So that's essentially what these invoices are. Also encumbrances. So you'll see commitment approvals. Anytime somebody wants to initiate a, um, a contract, then it has to go through a series of approvals as well. And within those approvals, it's not just approval on the finance. It actually goes, our project managers are the first step. It goes through our accountants to look at our funding sources and our budget. It goes to our contracts analysts to look at the, the um, uh, anything related to the contract or the procurement. Um, it goes to Lauren, our senior manager of business operations to ensure she's a like a double check on the financial analysts and the contracts analyst. Uh, it goes to Darren as director of construction to look at content and it comes to me and I approve every contract as the budget holder for the bond. Um, change requests, every change request to a contract goes through an approval process. Again, financial limits of authority for anything that's greater than $0. Um, $0 is if you're making a change to the terms and conditions of the contract, I'll be signing off on it. Um, change amendments to our GMP. Those are typically changes to the allocation of funds within the GMP for a CMGC project. Um, most of the time that's related to contingency moves. So if we're using owner contingency or contractor contingency, that is allocated through a GMP CA. Also financial limits of authority. Um, same thing with owner directive authorizations because there's financial risk involved with an ODA, um, those go through the same process that our change requests do. So there's a lot of stuff that's flowing through. We have queues. We all go into our queues every day and we're constantly approving and approving and sending these on or revising the back and asking for more information. Um, that's basically our daily life. Um, in addition to that, um, we do monthly project review meetings um, for all of our projects. We do those and we try to do them all in the first week of the month. We have so many projects now um, where we're kind of like the first week and a half and it's a pretty intense week and a half. Uh, what that involves is um, every one of our projects will complete what's called a PSU or project status update in eBuilder. That project status update, you could think of the initial set of information as a form where they're essentially summarizing all of the critical information. Um, it includes financial information, schedule information, project notes, um, things about permitting, anything that you can think of is kind of laid out in that initial form. Then we require them to add on additional documentation to back up that sort of summary and provide more context. Um, that backup documentation, I took a look at um, uh, the most recent one from Kellogg. 19 additional documents on top of the information in the form itself. We review the PSU. Um, it actually has to be approved by Darren. Bless his heart. I don't know if you recall how many projects we had in the water quality program. So there's a PSU for every one of those. About 20. Thank you, Steve Barblo. Just for water. <laughs> Just um, for water. And Darren reviews every single one of those and approves them. I don't approve them because I would be a bottleneck for that many, but I get a notification when they're complete. So I'm checking notifications to make sure that the PSUs have been completed um, so that I'm in the loop on those as well. And then we review the the information in the PSU at the monthly meeting. The monthly meeting actually includes not just Darren and I and the project team, it also includes our financial analysts, our contracts analyst, our communications manager, and, and Derek, who, as I mentioned before, kind of fills in a whole lot of stuff uh, and is a very useful person to have at those meetings. And we look at every single contract that is 
open. So in addition to the PSU, our financial analysts provide us with um, an update of every open commitment so that we can review open commitments and see where we are with the status of our, our contracts. Um, they show us the cash flow forecasting that's been completed and they compare it to um, actuals. And we have trend graphs so we can start to see how we are performing um, in actuals against what was forecasted. And we also have a report that looks at the status of our e-builder processes for the project. And that typically looks at um, the overall duration of a, a set of processes. So if we're talking about IAs, for example, the invoice approvals, we'll look at what our average duration is for all for those IAs that are open. Um, we'll look at what steps all of the current IAs are sitting in. So who has them? and how long they've been there. This is the walk of shame. So generally this is the point where we say, hmm, how come this has been sitting in the project manager step for this long? So we're looking at that information as well because um, time is money, to put it pretty simply. So um, that is, uh, I didn't want to get too, too far into the weeds, but I did want to give you some sense of the, the kind of um, oversight that we do on a regular basis. Happy to provide more information, but that's all I've got for tonight. Greg? Well, I don't have a question, but I, I do want to say that I think this is really good and it provides confidence to the people, to those of us on the Bond Accountability Committee. And I know when I've talked to people that live in the city of Portland, and I tell them I'm doing this. Uh, I also tell them that the kind of oversight that you folks are providing and they ought to feel comfortable about where the money's going. So this is one member that appreciates this report and what you're doing. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Kara. I just want to second that. I think what I took away from our initial conversation was that um, anything that could blindside the BAC would definitely have blindsided you first. And after going through that, I think that, that is absolutely apparent. We spend a lot of time looking ahead. And, and it's not to say that we can't be blindsided. I mean, that there, there were always be things that you, you could not anticipate or you did not anticipate. But we work really, really hard to minimize those things that we did not anticipate. Knowing that you read economic forecasts on a daily basis <laughs> that incorporate all the global changes going on to understand the supply chain, is pretty impressive in addition to everything else you're doing on a daily basis. Well, I just want to say you heard it from me first. Um, lumber is apparently coming down. <laughs> so, and Marina, you didn't you didn't put in there the amount of time it takes you to prepare for these meetings, um, in addition to everything else that you do. So you do a fabulous job. Thank you. I'm not I'm not looking for compliments here. Um, I will say that if you find uh, quirks in the reports, quirks, mistakes, you can blame me, but, but it is a lot of uh, data that we are often um, inputting by hand to get them into that format. So um, it, we do our best, but there are sometimes things where we have to go back and take another look, um, which to Williger, we'll get back to you on that one. Norm, you're the only one that hasn't said anything. Do you want to add anything else? No, I, I just <laughs> agree. And, and thank you for the, that uh, the little meeting we had over there. Uh, that was really helpful where we could sit down in a smaller group and talk about reporting and other things. And uh, I think in that meeting, I, I said I had a lot of confidence in the transparency and the oversight and what was going into uh, uh, gargantuan amount of work being over, the oversight that you do and the 
the management. Uh, it's 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 interesting. Like I think a lot of us, when we mentioned they're on this committee and the scope and breadth and the dollar amount of the work, a lot of people don't have any idea what's going on. And the fact that there was that lack of invest, investment, capital improvement for over 50 years before the bond measures were starting to be approved. So it's, it's, uh, I've, I've been in the commercial construction business for 40 years and uh, it, this is a staggering amount of work being done in a really difficult environment. And uh, I, I don't envy you guys. <laughs> it's, it's difficult and I think you're doing a, a fine job with it. We have a really great team and I'm, I, you know, I say this often, but I am so incredibly proud of my staff and the work that they do um, and the challenges that they overcome and the creativity that they, they use to overcome those challenges. So, you know, very, very happy to be sitting uh, in the position and in supporting all these folks. I'd like to springboard on that. I, be, I was a consultant for seven years and then took the director of construction under Marina last year, year and a half. Best person we've had in that seat since I've been here. Good. Thank you, Darren. Yep. Uh, that sounds like a lovely note on which for us to close. <laughs> Um, only six minutes late. I said I had to wait until he got that in. Yeah. Sorry, Kara. We didn't. We didn't plan that beforehand. <laughs> so it came out of left field, and Marina doesn't like to hear that kind of stuff. She's doesn't. Our next meeting will be July twenty seventh, uh, and we have not talked about where. But if we continue on with the, the pattern that we were trying to establish, that would be an in-person only meeting. Um, I have some ideas. I'm gonna look into them and then I'll get back to you. Okay, so we'll, we'll figure something out shortly. We'll be in touch. Hey, sounds good. Thank you, Marina. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.